All right, our final unit is uh, monetary policy, uh, which is the uh, Federal Reserve Bank's manipulation of uh, the money supply to achieve certain economic goals. But before we understand monetary policy, we have to understand banking, because the Fed uh, uses the banking system to do this. Before we understand banking, we have to know what money is. So we're going to talk about money and banking. All right, money has three functions. Um, <clears throat> this is very important. First is uh, it's a medium of exchange. You use it to buy stuff. That's its main function. Uh, but that's profound. That's important. It allows us to escape the complications of barter. I don't have to uh, figure out uh, what I can give you in exchange for your cow and then figure out what I have to bargain with someone else to butcher the cow for me. I can just teach. Remember comparative advantage and specialization. I can specialize in teaching and use uh my money from that to buy everything else I need. I can only do that, though, because we have this paper medium of exchange. Secondly, money is a unit of account. It's a yardstick for measuring the relative worth of goods and services. If I say it's used for comparison purposes, if you ask me, what does my house cost? And I say it costs $30,000. Uh, or, and you ask another person, they say, what is your, they say $900,000. Well, you picture two very different, if it's a house in the immediate area we're in right now, you picture two very different houses. 900000 you picture uh, a nice Mac Mansion in the preserve. Uh, $30,000, you picture uh, a shack in Bessemer. So it's a yardstick for relative value. Third function, it's a store of value. Uh, you can take $100 and put it under your mattress, and a year from now you can pull that $100 out and still buy stuff with it. So it enables you to transfer your purchasing power uh, to the future from the present. It's a store of value. Now, the amount of money out there uh, is not as straightforward a calculation as you would suspect. Uh, there, again, there is another army of economists that figure out how much money is circulating out there. And they have several definitions. The narrowest definition of money is called M1. You'll see this a lot uh, in the press. So it's part of your economic literacy. M1 is only two things, currency, actual paper money and coins, and checkable deposits, meaning the balances in your checking accounts. So currency and checkable deposits. Uh, currency obviously is acceptable um, for buying things, but you can also write a check or use your debit card. Uh, and so that balance in your checking account also makes uh, sense. As, um, as money. So this is the, the narrowest definition of money, currency plus checkable deposits. Next definition of money <clears throat> that the Army of Economists uh, keep track of is M2. Uh, it's a broader definition, so it includes all of M1 plus three other things. First of all, savings accounts. Many of you probably have a savings account. Uh, and you can rather easily, on the computer, uh, in an ATM perhaps, or certainly in the bank, transfer money from your savings account to your checking account or withdraw it from the ATM, in which case it's pretty spendable, pretty easy to get to, and so we, we include that. Also something called money market accounts, which is sort of a restricted checking account that pays you interest. Two, small time deposits, certificates of deposit, CDs. Uh, you deposit those with the bank. You agree to leave them for a certain amount of time. But you can get them out. You can pay a little penalty and get them out early if you want to. And so uh, this can be transferred into, into spendable cash pretty easily. So anything under $100,000, uh, any certificate of deposit under $100,000, we include an M2. And finally, money market mutual funds. Uh, let's say you invest your money in an investment fund, uh, a pool uh, issued by, let's say, Charles Schwab, and invest in uh, treasury bills. Uh, and they may even let you write checks on it. So it's pretty easy to get to, uh, and so we're going to include that in the M2 definition as well. So these three things plus M1 equals M2. From where does money derive its value? <clears throat> if I offer you a dollar, you'll take it, um, but it's just a piece of paper. Why, why, um, why is it worth a dollar? Well, several reasons. Number one, uh, acceptability. Uh, currency and checks are money because people accept them as such. <clears throat> people have confidence in the currency. Uh, maybe it's a lie that a dollar is worth a dollar, but it's a lie to which we've all bought into. Secondly, it's legal tender. It says it on the money. Take out your money and look at it. It's, um, it's a legal tender. Uh, it's, it's usable for all debts, public and private. The government has said so. 
Uh, and the U.S. government is the most powerful entity in the world, and if it says it's worth a dollar, well, that means something, right? So it, it legal tender. It's, it's by fiat. Fiat money refers to money that is uh, worth a dollar because the government has declared it by fiat to be worth something. It's legal tender. Number three, uh, money is like anything else. It, it depends on supply and demand, uh, and it derives value from its scarcity relative to its utility. We all want money, and there's a fixed amount of it. That gives it value. All right, let's talk about money and prices. <clears throat> Don't worry about this formula here. Uh, it just illustrates the fact that the purchasing power of a dollar varies inversely with the price level. Uh, if the price of a foot-long uh, Subway sandwich uh, increases from five to ten dollars. Clearly, money must be worth half as much. Or if we double the amount of money, uh, clearly each individual piece of money is worth half as much, and therefore Subway will want ten, not five dollars for the sandwich. There's an inverse relationship between the prices and the value of money.